It's my immense pleasure to be here in conversation with Liz Stiller for the second time uh, at uh, DLD. We actually did a panel together in Munich with Steffi a couple of years ago about the theory of clouds. Mm -hmm. We looked at you know, cloud computing. Uh, we looked at uh, the history of art, of clouds. I'd like to dedicate today to Hubert Damisch, the great Hubert Damisch who passed away one of the world's leading art historians who wrote an amazing book called Theory of Clouds uh, about Constable and you know, many other artists who looked at the cloud and connected in his speech this um, to the digital cloud. Uh, we, of course, in that panel, focused very strongly also on the poetry of clouds with Hans Magnus Enzensberger, one of Germany's giants of, you know, of literature. But at the very epicenter of it was, of course, Didos Cofidio Renfro's uh, pavilion for Switzerland, and uh, I'm Swiss, so at the time uh, when that happened, you know, I visited the Swiss National Exhibition, and uh, it was an extraordinary experience because we basically all disappeared in the fog of this building. Uh, it was basically the building as a as a fog, and so that was the panel. It's a very typical DLD panel, um, as it could only happen at DLD, where you would literally look at the theme, no, like clouds from all different uh, angles. Today, it's a very different uh, situation because we are actually doing this talk not to Munich, we're doing it in New York City, uh, in Lissa's city, uh, in a city where Lisa has built many amazing structures. Uh, ever since Tito Scofidio Renfro started as a very interdisciplinary design studio that integrates architecture, the visual arts and performing arts, New York City was the epicenter of the practice. So it's really a dream come true to have Liz here. Uh, also at the moment when the shed, uh, the landmark building, uh, Dilos Cofidio and Renfro have been working on together with David Rockwell opens very nearby here in March uh, 2000. Uh, next year. Next year, March, yeah. April 2019, so a year from now. Uh, and it was very fascinating the other day, uh, actually at the shed, to discuss uh, with Liz about the idea how a building, uh, in a similar way to a conference here, can bring together all the disciplines. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Liz Dillon. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Hans. Um, I'm going to speed talk because um, I have about 10 minutes. Um, to tell a story, and I want to tell a story about this neighborhood and our relationship with this neighborhood. And um, this is unusual. Architects typically don't get a chance to work in their own cities. Here we had a chance to not only do one project, but do mul multiple projects. Um, and, um, and they're all clustered. Many of them are clustered in this area. So about in 2004, we started the High Line. Um, an abandoned railroad track uh, that was uh, just um, scheduled to come down. Giuliani was going to tear it down by the uh, great pressure of developers around the area and property owners that it devalued the property. Um, it was argued uh, by citizen activists to save the High Line, much the way that Central Park was argued by Fre Frederick Law Olmsted, that it would contribute to the development of the city. Uh, parks are important as catalysts for development. Um, the High Line um, happened. Uh, it's still actually in progress. It's been like 14 years. And I'll just show you a couple of images. Um, it's a beloved park. Um, it has become uh, extremely popular. And, um, and it's also, there's a lot of unintended consequences. The High Line became a kind of a tractor for fashion, for fashion shoots. It became part of popular culture. So here is um, here are the Simpsons on the High Line. Um, here's an, uh, Marvel Comics um, on the High Line. So it's really become ingrained. Everything is now branded High Line. There's this High Line perfume that um, says, the scent of wildflowers, green grasses, and urban renewal. And that's the way it advertises. So we can't control it, though, because the High Line is unprotected as a brand, so it, it can be exploited in any way. Um, but what the High Line, what happened with the High Line is we argued initially that this park in the sky, which was very unfamiliar to New York, and there was a lot of resistance, 
um, was actually, they could attract 400,000 people a year. Where last year it attracted seven and a half or eight, eight million people. So this was entirely unexpected. The Highline also became a catalyst for development. And um, as of, well, this was when we did our book on the Highline, there were um, many, many developments happening at the, at the same time and many more today. Um, so the city um, uh, put in uh, and had great faith in, in us and put in uh, about a, uh, 150 million, in, including um, uh, contributions by uh, philanthropists. Um, and uh, in 20 years, it will earn one billion in tax revenue. So there are 33 new developments, 12,000 jobs and so forth. You could see the stats. So a, a real success by all standards. Um, and the Highline became replicated um, and it became a, an inspiration for other cities to do the same with urban infrastructure, unused urban infrastructure, um, kind of all over the world. And it seems um, like it hit a chord, um, maybe with issues of sustainability and wanting to recharge old sites um, with new vigor, but also the catalytic uh, opportunity that a park gives to a city. Um, this is uh, just a highway that over the weekend just gets AstroTurf and then people come out. I think this is in Latin America. But as a spin-off, we were asked, um, and this is all about spin-offs in a way, uh, we were asked by the city of Moscow to design a park uh, because of the High Line. And it was, it's the site opposite the Kremlin, right, at, right next to um, um, all the great monuments of, of Moscow uh, and on the river. And so we designed this park um, and it got built. And here it is, it's still kind of growing. It opened a little bit prematurely. Um, and it has some, um, we created topography. It was the site of the Hotel Rossiya, which was a 6,000 room Soviet era hotel. So um, a couple of um, images, you could see the Kremlin uh, to the top of the slide, uh, St. Basil's. And all this topography, all this is new landscape. It was never there before. It was it's all green and with topography and landscape from that's brought from all over uh, Russia. Um, there's this crust. We made a hill that's a roof of a new concert hall, and there's a glass crust. And the idea is when it snows, um, the hot air rises, and there, there's an area on top of this hill that will always be green. Um, just because of the way that the air moves. So we, we tried some passive uh, ways of, of creating um, more, um, you know, a, a great uh, park, all different times of year. This park, the first month it was open, a, m a million people came. <laughs> and um, there's something about parks, and it also became al already a national landmark, um, now on a postage stamp. Um, so, and then we had a visitor, um, actually on the first day, and trying to figure out, well, what this is, um, taking a, a little spin around the site and uh, trying to figure it out. I, so there is no, you know, one could do good projects for the city, but there are unintended consequences. Unintended people take the, uh, uh, the credit um, and whatever. It's pretty complicated. On the other hand, Mayor Bloomberg deserves full credit for the High Line and has been a fantastic client, really. And there are many spin-offs spin coming back to the High Line. So uh, Hans mentioned uh, the shed. So here's the High Line. You could see the, the outline of it. It's a mile and a half. And the red is the shed. This is a new cultural uh, institution that um, we put forward in 2004. Um, I'm sorry, 2008, at the height of the uh, economic collapse. And um, so what, what would be there? It's, uh, this is a, a proposition for a cultural institution that does not um, have an existence in New York. It's about um, new creations in uh, visual and performing arts and pop culture all together. Um, and it has a very distinctive feature. Um, it's a stack of galleries um, and it has an expandable shell that moves in and out that can produce outdoor space but can also extend the space to be very large and to host very large um, events um, and large installations, large theatrical productions, and so forth. And um, it does so using industrial crane technology. Um, and um, so we made this proposal, the city loved it. Um, we got a lot of buy-in and here it is now um, in construction 
And, um, oops, let's see if I can make this run. Ah, I can't make the, is there a way to make the video run? Anyone? Oh, it's running. Oh, it's not doing that on my, okay. So um, we did um, uh, um, a shoot just, just uh, in, in the construction sequence. So. By the way, it moves with a horsepower of one Prius engine, uh, the motor's on top, and this is all to be able to produce different kinds of space. It's a building that has great flexibility. Um, Alex Poots is the artistic director, and it's due to open um, next year, and Hans is involved. And we've been talking about this for years. Um, but it's, it's not so much about the building, it's about really creating a new opportunity for New York to do very, very new things. Um, so this um, uh, new uh, cultural startup is attached to another building, and this is a tall residential building, and this sits in Hudson Yards, which is the last undeveloped track in Manhattan. Now it's being totally developed with something like uh, uh, 20 million square feet of mixed-use development. And we and, and David Rockwell, our collaborator on this project, both the shed and the tower, we took on the tower actually to protect the shed uh, because there's crossover and we were able to expand the shed, its back of house um, and so forth, into the lower levels of this building. So here is the building and it's basically a rectangular building that morphs into a cloverleaf uh, residential tower and um, um, so here we are doing a park, um, a, a, uh, a new cultural startup. So the park is for the city of New York. The cultural startup begins with the city and is now a non-for-profit independent cultural institution. And then we do a tower for a uh, developer. So these are three very, very different um, entities. So um, here you see the cross-section of the shed, the, the stack of galleries, and uh, underneath the tower are the lower 10 levels that we're using for our back of house and our storage and our mechanicals and so forth. So, um, so this is a, a, a kind of strange ensemble that was never predicted. We never imagined that we would be doing any of that. Um, but this also sits, this tower sits in this. So it is something also unforeseen, and the, sh the, the High Line, um, while not entirely you know, to, to blame for it, but it is part of the consequence of the rezoning of this area and allowing this area to grow and shifting Midtown Manhattan to um, Chelsea area. Um, so um, as artists and architects, we couldn't help but respond to this artistically, so uh, we are doing um, a, um, a large-scale choral work called the Mile Long Opera, and it looks at and it talks about what uh, this area was in the high speed of change before and after, but not specifically um, about the Highland, but many cities all over the world that go through this post-industrial change. Um, the piece itself will be a mile, uh, actually a mile and a half long, and it will be 1,000 singers uh, from choirs from all over New York and um, all brought together in a, in a huge choir. Um, uh, David Lang is the composer and we have um, Claudia Rankin and Ann Carson as two poet writers who are writing for this. And the idea about writing about this change, this very, very rap rapid change, is done, will be done in a very poetic way. These 1,000 singers will be singing short stories, very, very micro stories, that are um, interpreted from real New Yorkers' experience um, at seven o'clock. So it's a biography of seven o'clock. Seven o'clock used to mean the time when stable family life, everyone comes together over the dinner, dad comes home. Um, it, it's no longer like that necessarily today. And so this looks at seven o'clock and the lives of a thousand people at seven o'clock. And um, so that wraps up um, a kind of very, very short story around all of our work in this one area. So. Thank you very, very much. I wanted to ask you first because 
in a way, there is an incredible uh, series of projects now in this neighborhood you have realized uh, in a very transformative way. I was wondering, because when Cedric Price came here and you were in the jury at the time and actually liked his project, he said what was initially missing was a kind of a lung yeah. that we re-inject kind of oxygen into the city. So I was kind of wondering what you feel now, you know, what would be the next step? Are there any mm. things which are unrealized? Do you have projects, dreams, uh, visions? For New York? You yeah, mean, is um, there something missing? Well, uh, New York is a, is a real estate town, so it's constantly getting, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, territorialized and privatized. My dream is to uh, preserve public space, preserve um, on uh, program space for the public. Uh, park space is, is part of that. If, if I could have it my way, I would take the whole ground floor of Manhattan and make it public. So all of these lobbies, um, the extended streets and, and everything, uh, um, because, you know, I think that architects um, ultimately, while we, can, we don't have a lot of power, um, we can uh, take more agency maybe than we're taking right now. So the, um, actually the, the park is agency taken by uh, citizen activists, like real New Yorkers, 30-year-olds that decided, wow, this could be a great park, and, um, and convinced the city ultimately to do that, and we helped them. Um, but uh, the, the shed was also a kind of concoction that came out of an architect's dream, and we were able to realize it. So, you know, I, I, I feel strong, very strongly that architects should not just be waiting for projects to happen, but should um, uh, envision projects and, and find the resources to do them. The, the Mile Long Opera, there's no institution that is doing that. We're doing that independently as an artist project that we've fundraised for and we've uh, brought all the talent together. Um, and so I very much believe in kind of a do-it-yourself architecture, um, uh, using, um, uh, working with the city and working with, uh, you know, all the resources that one could muster to make change, and sometimes to preserve and sometimes to remove. So the, your um, reference to Cedric Price and this um, site, which is Hudson Yards, which is now going to be millions of square feet of built space, um, of which we're, you know, we're part of it, and so we can't say it's bad or good. But, um, but, but Cedric Price just thought that it should just be left empty, that that was his big contribution to suggest that not to build on it. And sometimes removal, subtraction, is a, is a very good act. But the connection to Cedric, uh, and Cedric Price is an English architect. He was a good friend of mine, passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, he designed, for example, an airport on wheels so that you know, the airport could come where we need it. It's kind of neat. And then the other idea he had was an aviary. Uh, uh, it's one of the very few realized structures of Cedric. You can actually see whenever you're in London, you can go to the zoo and uh, see Cedric's aviary, and it moves in the wind. He even wanted to design an aviary which could eventually move out of the zoo according to the mood swings of the birds. So he always had this idea you know, of a mobile architecture, and that's, of course, what the shed is doing. It's fascinating to see the little animation, Liz, you were showing, uh, that the building can actually, you really just push a button and then within a few minutes, either this gigantic square, this gigantic plaza is covered, it becomes an exhibition hall, it becomes a concert hall, uh, or one can push the button again and then the plaza is liberated. So in a way, you're not occupying, you know, yeah. not occupying space. Could you maybe talk about that? Because I think that's a very interesting connection to Cedric, no? Yes, I mean, it, the, the project was very much inspired by uh, Cedric Price's Fun Palace, which was an unbuilt, um, uh, also it was an entertainment complex um, in the 1960s. It was planned in the 60s. It was, um, it was brought very close, and in the end, it didn't uh, get the permit to be built, but, but it inspired many, many generations of architects afterwards. And um, the idea was that it was a truly flexible building made of infrastructure. So it's like a plug and play, and anything can happen there at any scale, any time. Um, entertainment and culture were brought together. So it's like pop culture and high culture. There's no difference. And it, I think you know, it, came, it was a post-war idea that came out of um, automation and the idea that people had all this leisure time. Now you have to occupy them with the leisure time. So this 
was a kind of brilliant um, uh, project. It didn't, you know, it was, it was in, 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 in envisioned for tenure duration, but, um, but what was really, truly inspiring about it was that it was made out of a kit of parts and it was entirely flexible. And we interpreted that, and this was very different because some of, some of Cedric Price's buildings actually do move, and uh, uh, Pottery's Think Belt was a university on wheels, effectively, in an old uh, defunct factory. So he was actually, he predated the High Line and all of that. Um, so, but, but uh, the um, flexibility that we sought here was that we wanted to use more of the site uh, than initially we had access to, and, but what was a great result of proposing that we occupy that site 50% of the time, sometimes the shed is open and closed, to accommodate large-scale things, um, when, it's, when it's nested, it could be an outdoor space for cultural use and for the public as well. It could also be uh, brought into place and be a half indoor, outdoor, and uh, all the infrastructure is there. So it's like Cedric Price, an architecture of infrastructure where the whole design is made of structure and uh, 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 the ability to hold things, the ability to uh, supply uh, power to everything and make space and make shelter is very, very simple in a way, but it's designed. Now, there is a prelude to the shed as we speak for the next two weeks in the corner of 31st Street and 10th Avenue where the uh, Nigerian architect Kunle Adeyemi built the structure and we worked on it of course with the artistic director and CEO Alex Putz and the whole team we, we gathered with uh, Tino Segal who created a choreography uh, together with you know, uh, dancers, musicians, composers. There is a school by Asad Raza, Dorothea von Handelwan uh, is doing a, a kind of an evolutive text explaining the whole process so for those of you interested in you know in finding out more one can go and visit that in the next two weeks and there there is a mobile kind of device where one can discover the archive of Cedric Price and it was fascinating list that in this process I came to your your studio and I wanted to know how the shed began because I always find it so interesting how ideas are born no I once went to the office of Benoit Mandelbrot uh, with whom John Brockman, who is here, did legendary evenings uh, in New York City. And I asked Benoit Mandelbrot, you know, how did he discover the fractals? What was the epiphany? And he talked about, you know, uh, a blackboard and the kind of a vision he had when he entered a, uh, you know, a classroom with a blackboard and suddenly he saw fractals. Or Albert Hoffman, whom I knew well, who discovered LSD, told me about the discovery of LSD. So I wanted to know how Liz discovered or had this epiphany, you know, for the shed. And it was amazing. Uh, Liz opened a little box, and in this box <laughs> there was a matchbox. Can you tell us this story? <laughs> well, we were, we were sort of playing with fire, and um, um, those old-fashioned mat matchboxes where the, 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 the uh, matches just slide out of the sleeve. And we were just sort of playing with that and thought, wow, an expandable structure. This is really cool. And so we made our first models out of these matchboxes. And, uh, and then they, it sort of evolved. But I have to say that this, what looks like this giant uh, building and giant infrastructure is so, so simple. In the end, it's kind of like the matchbox. It's, yeah, it's just simply a rack and pinion um, system that, that, uh, that opens and closes the space. And you know, I'm just kind of stunned that nobody else had done that before exactly this way. And it totally makes sense for um, uh, inst it, cultural entities, or really any entities, that um, can expand into an open site and that can condition um, the air and space only when you need it. It's a sustainable idea. You don't need to program it. You don't need to program all that extra space and height. If you don't need it, you don't need to heat it, you don't need to cool it. But when you need it, everything is there. That could not be a better conclusion. Liz, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful.